welcome Leo. All right. Thank Today, you. Today, uh, I have the great pleasure for our eighth fireside chat of uh, sitting here with Leo Grelmeyer. Most of you in the room know Leo, born in Austria in 1930, lived through some pretty hard times early in his life, uh, but came to Canada in 1951 and teamed up with Hans Moser. And as they say, the rest is history. Uh, it, it's been a marvelous adventure, and thank you for coming, Leo, to share your stories with us. Do what? Yeah. Yeah. What story do you want to hear? Okay. <laughs> well, you could tell us about your childhood growing up, and so you were born in Ansfelden. Where's yeah. Ansfelden? Yeah, sure. Well, you just said I was born in 1930. We were 10 children in our family. Uh, we didn't have electricity in our house. It was an old house. It was about 400 years old. But uh, my father was shoveling coal all his life and, and uh, bringing up 10 kids. We lived way out in the woods. We didn't have any electricity or radio, TV. We didn't need that. We had all the fun built in. 10 children, there was nothing <laughs> missing. It was pretty rough at times, but it was okay. But also, my father love to sing, you know, I, I do too. And so he had his uh, 10 children, he sort of put together a little choir. He was really proud. That was his only joy that he had, you know. And uh, so we often were invited to some uh, weddings at the farm, you know, where they, they wanted us to be there and sing. And we could eat and drink all we wanted. That was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> At home, we didn't have much. But although we always had enough to eat before the war. And then Hitler took over in 1938, and then it was a different story. But the war started, and four of my brothers went to the front line, and my father did too. My father was in both world wars. He was in the First World War in the Dolomites in, in Italy, in the, what they call the Kaiserjäger. He was very proud of that. They were, oh boy, that was something. But he was still young enough in the Second World War, so he went to Russia with four of his sons out there. So I don't know how much you can expect from a guy. And I said, he shoveled coal all his life. That's all he ever did. And uh, he died at 65. And uh, he was an old man at that time. But you know, consider the life he lived. It's amazing he made it that far. But he did. He was a tough guy. But for us kids, we didn't care if we ran around in rags or who the hell gets to them. You know, <laughs> we were out in the woods and playing it rough with each other and so on. In fact, uh, I broke my first leg in, in a fight with my brother. With, <laughs> no, no, not a fight, a wrestling match. And uh, he came on top of me and the leg crumbled under me. And so that was it. But the second leg, I. I broke then when I came to Canada. The first time I ever skied in Canada with uh, wooden skis. Our landlord gave us money to buy those wooden skis and I skied in White Mount Creek in Edmonton and there was an icy patch in front of a tree and I, wham I hit that tree so bad that the bones were sticking out to my ski pants in the back. At least there was no question it was broken. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there was just two. I broke five altogether, but, but Hans beat me, he broke six. <laughs> yeah. Good. He, had, he had to compete with me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we went through the war then, and uh, I then was a plumber apprentice. I was taken out of school when I was 13 because they needed the labor. So, and I was quite glad to leave school. I, I didn't go to, like to go to school. So then I was a plumber apprentice. And then the bombing really started in our city because Linz was the city. I grew up in a little town called Ansfelden, a little farm town. 1938, we moved to another town, it was called Traun. So my brothers could go to high school and my father didn't have that far to go to work. And uh, so I was working in the, in the city, but Linz was also Hitler's hometown. So the Americans really let us have it with their bombs, oh my God. I remember on April 20th, I think it was, 
because that was Hitler's birthday, and uh, he had huge plans drawn up with his uh, architect uh, Speer, I think was his name, and uh, he had an art museum in Lenz that was going to be looked the cathedral in Rome looked like a, an outhouse compared <laughs> to that. I mean, unbelievable what he had in mind. And it looks like on April 20th, the Americans said, well, like it, let's take it down for him so he can rebuild. <laughs> they, they sure let us have it that time. It was awful. And then I had to walk home from across the, the city and uh, to my hometown because there was no uh, trains, no buses, nothing. You know, the, so I walked home about 10 kilometers. And uh, I remember I stepped over all those bodies all over the place. So you avoided um, military service. You were too young for the what? You were too young for the army. Yeah, I just we had the what they call pre-military ausbildung, pre-military training, which was a bunch of bullshit because we were trained just like the soldiers. We had our rifles, we had our machine guns, our grenades, and everything. And we thought they were great toys. We loved it. We, you know, kids are stupid. <laughs> and and uh, we, we love to play this game, you know. <laughs> and then we went in the mountains a lot to, to those camps in the summer and in, in the winter in the Hitlerjugend. So that was great for us. You know, we had good food there because those camps were always looked after well. So that was important. And we went into my favorite sport anyway, in the mountains. And uh, the, the old sergeant that we had, he, he trained us and he was very good to us because he, he was glad he didn't have to go to the, the Russian front anymore. He said, let me look after my little boys here, and that was great. So he was happy, and so were we. I say, old, old Sarsen, he was maybe 45, but to us he was old, you know. We were 14, 15, and so on. But it was a lot of fun. And this is where a lot of my mountain sport developed, the skiing, the climbing, it was great. It was, it was good training for us, you know. Good physical exercise for the yeah. health. And you had a, a mentor in those early years, Fritz Kogler? Fritz Kogler. Well, that was after the war. He, I joined the mountain club, and uh, he was sort of the president of our club, and he was about 10 years older. He only had one eye because he was shot through here in Russia, and so he lost his one eye. I didn't know until one day we were in a mountain hut and we had uh, rooms for two and two, which was unusual. Usually we had a 10 sleep in a row and so on. But I, I was with him in, in one room and uh, in the evening all of a sudden, I made a finger, <laughs> look, uh, what? <laughs> I had no idea because that glass eye looked just like the other one, you know. He took that eye out and then he closed. I said, holy shit. <laughs> and then, then I realized when, when we skied, he always looked like this, you know, because he couldn't look across here, you know, so he had to turn his head like that. Then I was aware, you know. But the poor guy, later on, I was ready in Canada then, he one day cut a piece of glass and then before he broke it, he lifted it over and he broke and the splitter went out and went to the other eye. Oh, no. I mean, it's unbelievable that a poor guy, why couldn't it hit the glass eye? No, it went to the other eye. And his wife said to the, in the hospital, couldn't he take one of my eyes? I got two. She said, no, we're not that far yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> so he had to leave. But I, I went there three weeks after he got the second glass eye. And uh, he was laying there on the couch blind. And uh, I walked in and his wife told me by the door what happened. So I walked up and said, Fritz, do you remember me? He thought for a moment. Oh, Leo. That's right. He recognized the voice, you know. But a few years later, my wife and I, we went there to his house and they invited us for dinner. He was sitting there with two glass eyes, but he always looked wherever the voice came from. You could swear he can see me, yeah. but he didn't. He was totally blind. He was laughing like hell. He had one glass after another, wine, and <laughs> who cares, you know. But he was a great friend. And he really 
brought me up a lot, much more than my father, because he was very patient. My father was not. And uh, I went a lot to the mountains with him. You know, he was teaching us climbing and skiing and all that. But he's dead now, too, but anyway. Yeah, and what were some of them? What, oh, you climbed in the Todeskeberga, uh south of uh, Traun? The Todeskeberga, the Spitzmauer? Todeskeberga. Yeah, we did a lot of climbing in there and skiing in the winter because it was close to us. We could go with the bicycle there sometime on the weekend. And, uh, so, and then later on, then we went to Italy, to the Dolomites, to do some fancier climbing. Yeah. And, uh, that, that was crazy, yeah. And who were you climbing with? Who was your partner? Well, Margaret Arthur, but then he got killed later on. I was in Canada already. He fell off the Mamalata south face with his partner, and he was dead. But that, that was sad. He was a great guy. In, in, in Austria, we didn't change our climbing partners like they do here. We, we got one partner, and that was it for life. We climbed together. But then I went to Canada, so he had to pick up another partner. And so I came to Canada in, in 51. But anyway. Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. That was sad when I heard yeah. that. But. So, <clears throat> so how did you end up coming to Canada? That, that's a famous story that Hans Moser had one one version, and you had another I version. I don't know. But, well, the true version. <laughs> <laughs> no, because um, in 51, there was all of a sudden unemployment in Austria. Even though so many things had to be done yet, everything was bumped to hell. The hospitals were rebuilt, government buildings, schools. And there was no money for uh, fancy homes and uh, shopping centers. So there was unemployment. And yet so many things had to be done, but no money. So my foreman one day said, uh, Mr. Grillmeyer, you, tomorrow some people are gonna be laid off in our company. He said, I have no idea if you're one of them, but you know what, a friend of mine he signs up people to go to Canada. And my ears went up right there, Canada, hey. He said, you're 21, you got nothing to lose. You, you go there for two years, if you don't like it, you come back after two years. Be a hell of an experience. You probably come back with a little bit of money. And so I said, yep, yeah, I'm going. He said, okay, take my bike, go over there on the Hauptplatz in Linz. I phoned him in the meantime, tell him everything about you, so he will know. And so when I got there, he already knew everything about me. So I had to give him all my particulars. I had my passport with me. And he said, we contact you in a few weeks. Okay. In a few weeks, they contacted me. And Hans then signed up too. And uh, we have to go to Salzburg to see the Canadian consul there. Okay. So we went there. But anyway, that evening, that Friday evening, I saw Hans in town. He just came down with a bike, and I, I was going to go to a movie theater before, but uh, I didn't like the movie they played, so I said no. So I went, I'm going to have a beer in the gas house, and then I go home. But on the way over, I saw Hans coming with the bike, and so, hi, Leo, hi, Hans, this and that, and yeah. And uh, I said, Hans, you know what? I'm going to Canada. I said, Canada? Wow. That's something. And you know, he already knew a little bit about Canada because he went to high school and I didn't. So we were talking about that. I remember <laughs> one time he said, uh, you know, in Canada, you could never go under. You can always be a trapper and at least you have something to eat. I mean, we had no idea what it's like to be a trapper. <laughs> but we, were, <laughs> we were as stupid as can be. But anyway, after a while, I said, Hunt, why don't you come with me? Be two of us, be a lot more fun, you know. So she said, yeah, you know, I really like that. I said, listen, let me talk to my mother first. Because she was a tough lady, and if he made a decision of his own, I think she would have beat him up. <laughs> but anyway, 
So then after about five days, he came to my house and said, Leo, I'm coming. And my mother was very happy because uh, she didn't want your little boy going across the big water all along. So that was great. And then we had to go to Salzburg and find out. I remember they called up Hans first. And uh, when he came out, he said, Leo, tell him you want to go to Edmonton. OK. <laughs> so because he too, he said, uh, we want to be somewhere in the mountains. And the, guys, <laughs> the guy realized Hans was an electrician. I was a plumber. Industry, Edmonton, great. So, and we looked at the map of Canada. Well, that's a big map. And, and the mountains are not too far from Edmonton <laughs> on, on, on that map. But then I realized I got off the train in Edmonton from Quebec. I was there months before Hans came. And uh, I looked around. <laughs> 360 degrees, well, where the hell are the mountains? <laughs> oh, not too far, 300 miles. 300 miles, 450 kilometers. In Austria, no matter which way I go, I'm out of the country. <laughs> and that's not far? Well, not to Canadians, but to an Austrian, oh no, that was terrible. But anyway, so we went to Spirit River for a month up there. And then after a month, I came back, I had $45, I was rich. And Hans just arrived from, from uh, uh, London, London, no. He came from Genoa. Huh? He came from Genoa. You came yeah, from Genoa Brandon. to? To? A city. Montreal, maybe? Uh, no, no, a port city, where they had the big explosion the First World oh, War. Oh, Halifax. <laughs> Halifax. And then by train to Edmonton. And I just came back from Spirit River, so we met there, now we're together, everything's okay. And then we got a job together in um, White Court, Alberta, as loggers. Well, that was a joke. I mean, we were skinny runs. I mean, those other loggers out there, they had muscles here bigger than my legs were. And we're supposed to compete with them? Oh, didn't last very long there. But anyway, <laughs> On the way up, and, oh yeah, and then Hans said, Leo, we need a guitar. We don't have a guitar. I mean, how can we exist without a guitar? He could play the guitar very well. So, okay, so we went to a guitar store, and a music store, and uh, he tried all kinds of, and then he got one and said, yeah, Leo, that one. It's easy to play, sounds nice, that one. Okay, he said, how much? $17, okay. Paid seven dollars. Now we have a kid. Are we okay? <laughs> so we got on the train from Edmonton. That is about 120 or 30 miles north west of Edmonton. You know Spirit River? No, uh, White Court. And uh, so as we were used to in Austria on, on Friday night, we usually go to the mountains in the train, and all the young kids together. And somebody always had a guitar. There's start playing and singing. Everybody was singing there. So we thought we'd do the same thing here. <laughs> but you know, that wasn't customary here. The people all looked at us, what the hell? <laughs> Not only that, but we sang all in German, which wasn't <laughs> <laughs> too welcome at that time. So we thought, oh. But we didn't care, we sang anyway. But pretty soon, the people kind of liked the, 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 the sounds of it. And so they moved closer and they were humming with us. And then I remember one guy said, uh, say, do you guys think you could uh, sing Lily Malane in German? Yeah. Well, I said, yeah, that's the only way we can sing it. <laughs> so, oh, that would be great. So we started singing, and they joined us in English. And I tell you, after that, we had nothing but friends. We realized right there, aha, uh -huh, music, that's the key. That's, that's what it is. And when we got off the train, they all wanted to shake hands with us and say goodbye. They were very sad when they saw us leaving because for once they had a little culture, a little fun on the train, you know. <laughs> so we went out to this bush camp and did the same thing there. And, but then we got fired after three days, so. <laughs> <laughs> you, bent the, you bent the saw, didn't you? Huh? You bent well, the saw? Yeah, because 
We had to cut those trees down and cut it in lengths. I think they were for railroad ties. So at one time, we cut this one tree down with hand saws. That was before chainsaws. And the tree fell on another tree. I said, the hell with it. We're going to cut this one too. You know. So we cut this one too. The two of them fell on a third tree. <laughs> I said, damn it. We invested that much. We're going to cut that one too. But then it started kicking, pretty dangerous, you know. And I remember Hans said, Leo, when they go, you grab the saw and run this way, and I run that way. So then all of a sudden they started coming. I said, to hell with the saw. I run, and he ran. <laughs> and of course, the saw got a little, was one of those long saws and got a little kink in it. And we had to take it back every night for the saw filer to make him new again for the next day. And then he saw this saw, oh no. So he went to his boss and he said, look what he did. You know, so we got fired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we weren't too unhappy. So we went back to Edmonton, but we didn't have any money then to go back. And uh, there was one Czechoslovakian fellow in the camp who gave us 20 bucks. He said, uh, here, with that you can go to Edmonton. And if you are the kind of guys I think you are, you will send it back to me. Well, we did. And we actually became friends with him later on. So, but then we were in Edmonton and we were looking for a job. Well, I could hardly speak any English. Hans spoke a little bit because he learned a little bit in, in high school. You know, I didn't. Um, so, but Hans remembered a friend of his he went to school with in Austria, Franz Dopf, who is now in Calgary. He's, uh, he has an uncle in Edmonton. He has a taxi service. So we looked in the telephone book. Yeah, there's Louis Dopf, taxi service. Aha. So we phoned this guy, and he said, yeah, OK, come on out to my house. We talk about it. And Edmonton was very simple. There was avenues and streets, you know, the, by number. We could easily find our way. Oh, that was great. So we went there, and uh, then he said, uh, look, it's almost Christmas. Forget about it now. You stay here over Christmas. After New Year's, I find you a job. Well, we stayed there. They even made us a little Christmas present, and we felt very much at home, very nice. So after New Year's, then he found Hans a job as an electrician on, on a line somewhere. I forgot what that was. And he found me a job as a plumber for 67 cents an hour. <laughs> well, well, better than nothing. I could, I could pay my room and board with that. Good enough. And so, so we worked for about a month like that. And then uh, our landlord loaned us some money to buy some Norwegian wood skis. Split, split kennel, what they were called. And uh, so we went out to Whitemouth Creek on, on the riverbank in Edmonton, and that's where I broke my leg the first day. And so I took care of that. And then Hans took care of me for about five months, you know, because I, I, I had a cast up to here for, yeah. And when I went to the hospital, the ambulance could drive right up to me. That was a good thing. And uh, took me to the university hospital. And uh, there were three girls out there. They were watching us. I mean, we couldn't ski with a dam either, but we skied fast, you know. <laughs> and that's, that's why I broke my leg. And uh, so the next day in the hospital, oh, yeah, and there was a, a priest who gave me the last thing like that. <laughs> because I was Catholic in those days, I thought, oh, it's not. In Austria, when they give you that, you with one foot in the grave. <laughs> what the hell? And he said, uh, yeah, the Abschneiden. He could speak a little bit of German. Abschneiden in German means cutting off. <laughs> what he meant was they have to cut. Not Abschneiden, but they have to cut. <coughs> but, but he didn't know the difference. And I thought, my God, when I wake up, I'm going to have one leg. Jesus. I'm in a French country, I can't speak the language, I don't have any money, I have one leg. Oh no. 
Anyway, next morning I woke up in the hospital and <laughs> cast right up to here. There must be something in it. <laughs> oh, I still have a leg. Woo! Man, was I glad. But there was a bouquet of flowers on my night table. I thought, what the hell is the matter with Hans? <laughs> You're not like that. So then Hans comes in and said, Hans, are you crazy? Why are you buying me flowers? <laughs> I didn't buy you flowers. So you look, there was a card inside. There were three girls signed. Well, we don't know any girls here. They were out on the hill, they saw us. And they, they sent those flowers in the card. And about 10 minutes later, those three girls came in. Great. <laughs> Good looking, we had three girlfriends, one to spare. And uh, oh my God, so they took care of us. Really well, they were so nice. They said, look, if you could teach us how to ski like that, we, we would teach you English. They realized we couldn't speak English. Great. Everything, everything was hunky-dory, and, and Hans took, <laughs> <laughs> took care of me for about five, six months, you know, because wow. I then took all. Then we moved to Calgary as soon as we could, because from there at least, we could see the mountains, <laughs> so I felt a little better. And uh, then I, I took all kinds of jobs. My first job was in the model dairy in Calgary. It's a restaurant now. We were there the other day. <laughs> and uh, I was making ice cream by the ton every day. And the, the, the real stuff was in there, milk, butter, and, and the real pails of food, everything. Uh, Model Dairy was very famous for its ice cream at that time. And I was in charge making that ice cream. Okay. And then, but then I had to work every weekend. And Hans was off in the weekend. He went to the mountains and I couldn't. I had off Wednesday, Thursday. So I went alone. Well, didn't. So I quit that job. And I got a job at the Purity, Purity Flower. It was along the railroad there. It doesn't exist anymore. I had to sew up all those bags, you know, flower bags. That was okay, and I was on the weekend off, and we could go together in the mountains on the weekend. And then Louis Dopf, the guy that gave us the first job in Edmonton, he phoned one day, he said, Leo, I have a job for you up in Cold Lake. They built this air base up there uh, for the Canadian Air Force. And uh, he would have a job as a plumber there for a dollar eighty an hour. Whoa, that was big money. So I thought, Christ, yeah. And I had to pay off the hospital yet, the doctor, the immigration, they wanted their money back for a fair over. I owed about a thousand dollars, which is a lot of money when you don't have it. And uh, so, I said, yeah, I took that job. But in a way, I was very sad because I had to leave the mountains and hunt. So I went up there and I worked there for two years. And uh, you couldn't spend any money. All the money we made, I, I could put in the bank because room and board was all free. And uh, so after two years, I remember I walked down on, on Jasper Avenue in Edmonds and there was a travel agent and there was a, a picture of the Queen Elizabeth, the biggest ship in the world, in the window. A trip, trip from New York to Cherbourg. I said, wow. So I went inside and said, uh, could I get on that ship? I thought this is only for rich people, but uh, of course, if you have the money. You know, it was $350 there and back. Queen Elizabeth going over, Queen, the Queen Mary coming back. I said, I put the money down. I'm going. And so I went for my first holiday to Austria. And that was really something new because in those days, it was known once you go to America, well, North America, we never see you again. That was it. So I was the first one ever to return. That was a sensation, you know. And I had thousands of dollars in my pocket. <laughs> I could <laughs> afford all the fancy ski resorts in Austria, which I could have never afforded before. 
but now I can, you know. So I stayed there for three months and had a hell of a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back at Easter, 55. I went to, uh, oh yeah, and I had a girlfriend in Austria, which I wanted to marry and bring her back to Canada. And at first she said, yeah, yeah, she will come. And then after that, she changed her mind. No, she wants to marry that gendarme. I said, well, go to hell. <laughs> so I was kind of hurt. But anyway, so I went <coughs> by train to Innsbruck and then to Paris. And in Innsbruck, a girl came on the train which struggled with her suitcase up into the net. So I tried to help her and talk to her in German. She said, I'm sorry, I can't speak German. So I said in English, uh, can I help you, you know? Oh, you speak English? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going back to Canada again. Oh, wow. So we went to Paris and she was a student at the university. She was from, I think, Cincinnati in the States. And she had rich parents, so she went to university in, in Paris. So we spent a week together. It was beautiful. <laughs> well, she showed me around Paris like I've never been shown before. <laughs> and then, then we had to, yeah, I had to go to the train station to go to Cherbourg in France and from there catch the Queen Mary and go to New York. But uh, we were very sad. We didn't want to part anymore, you know. We loved each other and, oh, shit. <laughs> so anyway, we got to that train. There's a guy standing there. He said, sir, are you trying to go to Sherbrooke to catch the Queen Mary? He said, yeah. He said, I'm sorry, but the ship couldn't leave England because of a big storm. There's some money for you to stay another two days in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Man, did I grab that money. <laughs> we had a great time for another two days in Paris. <laughs> Most welcome thing I've ever seen. Oh, it was great. I know. Well, Leo, we're, we're missing the climbing stories. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to hear a climbing story? <laughs> okay. yeah. Oh, hey, the other day I saw a picture on the computer of me climbing somewhere. I've never seen that picture before. Did you get that picture? Um, Fertile took it. When, when you and Fertile and Hans climbed Gromar Chimneys back in the 80s, I think that's when the picture was taken. What did we climb? Hmm? What did we climb then? Gromar Chimneys. It was the 30th anniversary climb. And Fertile took those pictures. Oh, I yeah, you got there too. Yeah. Oh, that's where it was. I think that's where the picture came. Yeah, yeah. because usually I wasn't leading that climb because the rope went from here up. Mm. Usually I, I, I was leading the climbs, but here I wasn't, so I yeah. was wondering, what the hell was yeah. that? What climb was that? Yeah, I think that's where it was. Oh, probably. Yeah, we, we missed that story. I don't know. Anybody want to hear about Grommar Chimneys? Yeah. They, that's a pretty classic story. Can you tell us? That, that was 1952, just before Cold Lake and before Europe, and yeah, you were still recovering from a broken leg. What date is today? Uh, it's, uh, it's no, it was November 23rd when... November 23rd when we did the when first you climb. When did the first climb. Because we had a beautiful Indian summer that time in 52. And, uh, but that day it broke. Actually, we went with a few people from the Alpine Club. They wanted to come with us too. One of you back here. No, he wouldn't speak up. But anyway, <laughs> they, they turned around again. We, I picked that hoot because I thought that's the weakest thing to that face. Hans had another hoot picked. And I said, no, 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 let's do this one. So we did, and uh, we had Isabel Spreed, an English girl, with us in the middle of the rope, and Hans and myself. And Hans was roping her up, very crude in those days with the ropes, you know, we had. And uh, in the meantime, I got impatient and climbed up the first pitch by myself without a rope. 
and then I was on top, and I didn't want to down climb it again because you know down climbing is always a little more difficult than up climbing. So I hollered to Hans. I said, Hans, throw me up the end of a rope, you know, so I can tie myself in. He said, Yeah, go ahead. You might as well lead then. Go ahead. Okay. So I started leading and uh, I led the whole thing. But uh, we got up and it's not difficult, but then you get up to the chimney and it, I was known for chimney climbing. I was good at that. So Hans said, hey Leo, this is your turn. Go ahead, the chimney. Okay, so I did. And then it started snowing. And I don't know. I, I looked up to the chimney and I couldn't see an escape up there yet in a snowstorm. Ay, ay, ay. It's no fun. But anyway, so I climbed up. I did that chimney. No problem. In the chimney, I was away from the snow. The snow fell on the outside. Uh, then I got up. And all of a sudden, at the very top, I saw a hole through the mountain. I thought, I wonder if I could make it through that. So I climbed up, and sure as hell, I was skinny enough in those days. I took the pack off, tied it on the rope, and climbed through it, and I was on top. Then I brought up Isabel and Hans. Ha ha, we did it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but I only had street shoes like those. And, uh, well, we didn't have fancy climbing shoes and all that equipment in those days. So then the, the snow accumulated on top, so we had to walk down in the snow, down the back and down to the highway, and then the other people from the Alpine Club arrived, and we went next day with them to somewhere climbing. But uh, when I got to the bottom, the sole came off my shoes. <laughs> and, uh, well, that was the end of that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a popular climb now. It's huh? it's a popular climb now. Everybody does ground But Sydney. it's it's a good climb for beginners. If they want to start out rock climbing, that's a good way to do it. It's easy enough. And uh, but you know, one day I went down. There used to be a service station down below. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. It's not there anymore. It was run by Indians. And I went in there and cast up and went in with my credit card. And then he, he took the credit. They looked at the card, is it? I guess you know that mountain, don't you? <laughs> and he said, Leo Grillmeyer on it. I said, yeah, how the hell would you know? He said, you know, a friend of mine dragged me up there one day. I was never so scared in my life. <laughs> he said, you're an Indian, and this is named by Indians, Yamnaska. You should climb this. So he did. And he said, oh my God, was he ever scared. <laughs> but <laughs> what's a funny story. This guy recognized right away, oh. Well, it is scary if you're not used to it. Well, I guess I can so, tell yeah. you from experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, Anyways, so, oh, gee. But so what about the little Yoho? That, you were in the little Yoho skiing well, at Christmas in the little Yoho. That was later because... When I came back from Austria in, in 55 at Easter, Hans already started ski touring as a business. He met some of those people in Montasinibuen with Erling Strom, okay? And one of those guys, Fred Pessel, told him, Hans, you're good enough to do your own thing. You don't need to work for somebody else. And so he did, and Fred Pessel was his first guest and was also my first guest up there. But uh, in 55, when I came back, I found Hans with a broken leg. <laughs> he was up at the uh, Bull Summit Fire Lookout. That's one job he could do with a cast on it. And uh, so I went up there, visit him. And then he said, Leo, this fall when I st start ski touring again, I need help. Could you help me out? I said, sure. So in the, after Christmas, we went to Little Yoho, you know, carrying up our supplies and everything. And usually by the end of January, beginning of February, we started ski touring. And our guests started coming. And our first guest was Fred Pessel. I, I always remember that. And he asked me to, uh, 
buy three bottles of that Crown Royal whiskey in Calgary because he was Canadian and he was American. He, I mean, he was Austrian originally, but he worked for General Motors as an engineer. So I said, with that, we have enough for the whole group. And that's what I got uh, used to Crown Royal. Mm. <laughs> Anybody anyway. wants to have a drink with Leo afterwards? <laughs> you know what his poison is now. Yeah, huh? Crown Royal. Oh. Yeah. But, uh, and then the ski touring. We did that quite a few years. It grew and grew and grew. And then we usually went to Little Yoho for a couple of months. Then we go to Monte Cineboin for a week. And then uh, at the end, we go to Rogers Pass in, in May because for the cold snow. We, we carried our skis and walked up with our boots. You could walk on top of the snow and then ski down when the cold snow was ready. You know, when the first snow, when the sun gets on it, it softens up a little bit, and then you ski down on that stuff very fast and very beautiful. One day we had a, how the hell could I find? Lynn, remember the, the Austin fellow with one leg? Herbert Matz. He had a, a ski business in Montreal, and he invented, he lost his leg in Russia in the war. But he was a good skier before the war, so he wanted to ski again. So he invented those scratches with those little skis at the bottom. They were spring-loaded, they come up like this, and when you put them down, they flop down, and those were his skis, and the one ski. He always said, you know, I have no problem parallel skiing like you guys. Because <laughs> yeah? he only had one ski. Yeah. But he went on, on Rogers Pass up to the steps of paradise with us, which is about 4,000 feet on that one leg. He had those scratches with big baskets on it, his one ski across his back, and he walked up like this, bang, bang, bang. He was never the last one on top. And on the way down, you could forget him. He was gone. Man, he was he good. He was third in the world championship with amputee skiers. And, uh, but ski touring with on one leg? Wow. That guy was something else. But <laughs> he did. Wow. Yeah. So, so that was Rocky Mountain Guides Limited, your company, yeah. in the little Yoho there. And how did that grow into helicopter skiing? Well, we were exploring everywhere for ski touring. And so Hans then started exploring in the bugaboos. And he had a, a group, Pookie Dodge and his gang near Boston, somewhere there. And Pookie Dodge was the best skier in the Olympics in 52 for the Americans. He never won a medal, but he was the best American. And uh, he was good, and he was Hans's guest. And he said then, you know, they were ski touring, had a tent up on the glacier and go from there up and ski down. He said, next year, when we come back, have a helicopter here. They can fly us up and you guide us down. We had this kind of helicopter, like over there, with Jim Davis as the pilot. And then that and just took off. You know, we couldn't stop it anymore because those, those people advertised for us, you know, and uh, before it took us four or five hours to get to the top. Now, with this thing, we were there in, in 15 minutes. We had the first two people there, then you go down, bring up another two, in about a half an hour or so, we have a group there. So then the one guide with this group, he ski down, then he come down and pick up another two, the next group up, you know, and we had a whole group up there in half an hour before it took us like four or five hours. So we, did, we really had the world by the ass. And then, uh, <laughs> and then the helicopter skiing was born and, and, and kept going. And it wasn't our doing, but... Uh, and, um, <laughs> no, those first few, few years, I think, you, you were in the little, yo, you were 65, six and seven, 66, you were running Hans's operation in the Little Yoho. Yeah. 
the trade I had to run the operation in Little Yoho, well, he was going to Roger's Pass, like we broke it out and his gang. And uh, he was exploring. All, Hans was an explorer all mm -hmm. the time. And then uh, Cineboyne and all those places, and I had to run Little Yoho. Yeah. And then I remember he did the heli skiing already for three years. And Kiwi, where is he? Somewhere back there. Right there. Oh, yeah. He was Hans's helper in, in, the, in the bugaboos the first two years. The, he couldn't ski for the dam, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he loaded up his pack like hell, like for an expedition, and skied like hell down until he piled up and then pick himself up and ski again. Am I right? <laughs> but anyway, and Pookie Dodge was the one, was his teacher. He was teaching him, he said, you're good for better than that. So he was teaching him how to ski. He had this pack and his eyes are sticking straight up every time. I don't know why he never killed himself. <laughs> yeah. But and then in 67. And then you, the third yeah, year, yeah. Hans said, Leo, you better come up because we have to do something better than the old lumber camp. Yeah. We had an old lumber camp from which we did the skiing. It was, it was okay. It was a warm bed you could sleep in. We had good food. And we said, what we're selling is out there. You know, this is just a necessity. That was okay. But later on, people got a little more fancy. I, I remember one guy from New York, Vic, not Victor Marler. What? Huh? Ben Walsh. Walsh. Ben Walsh. Walsh. Yeah. He came from his cabin to the bunkhouse for breakfast and said, Hans, I think he was very polite. He was very polite. And uh, I think there's something wrong with my cabin. And Hans thought, oh, shit, you know, what the hell are you complaining about? <laughs> so he went out there and, oh, my God. The snow slid off from, from the roof about that thick and fell against the wall and put the wall on top of his bed. <laughs> and he was in bed and, and to squeeze out of there. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So we shoveled the snow away and put the wall back up and the roof. Okay. <laughs> But anyway, it was pretty rough then. But uh, then we realized we had to build something better than the old lumber camp, you know, because the Americans kept coming and they wanted something better. And so, but Hans and I, we didn't have any money. So, but we walked around everywhere. I remember across the valley first, and then we thought, no, this is too difficult to get the supplies up there in the fall. So. We then walked the other way, where the lodge is now, on an old moraine, really. And uh, we said, yeah, from here, look at the view, you know, beautiful. Okay, here. Yeah. Okay, you're in charge. I was in charge. I have to build this thing. <laughs> and uh, so Franz Dopf was the contractor, and I was the superintendent. I was the plumber. I was the <laughs> main laborer, everything. So we got this lodge. But the way we financed it, we, uh, Jack McKenzie and Paolo gave us a little bit of money. And then somebody gave Hans this idea about a skier's loan. If they give us $5,000, they get a free ski week and 6% on their money. That was a hell of a good deal for them, because they were skiers. They get a free ski week every year. Every year, yeah, as long as we. Just one year. No, no, as long as we have their money, but when we pay them the money back, then that's it. Yeah. So they were very disappointed when they get their money back, yeah. <laughs> because they lost their privileges, you know. <laughs> so when we built the next lodge, the Caribou Lodge, in which Kiwi was in charge then, we said, "Hey, here's my money," <laughs> you know. So they want to give us money again. So it was a great way to finance this thing. And then every year we paid so many off, and eventually it was our lodge. Great. Yeah, so, good thinking. Good. And yeah. you managed the lodge for I 22 managed the lodge years? For 25 years, yeah. Yeah. And then and Lynn was the chef. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Lynn is uh, Leo's wife over here. 
Yeah. And, she, and she was the one when we hired her in 69. And then she said to me, Leo, could you teach me a little bit about the mountains, hiking and eventually skiing and so on? I said, sure. So we went on a, quite a, an extensive hike the first day with her. And uh, she was very enthusiastic and so oh, no problem. She came home, she took her shoes off and the blood was running out. Holy smoke, she had blistered so bad in the back. Never complained. He said, well, you won't be walking for a month now. Oh no, just give me a few band-aids. Next day she was all hacking again. <coughs> I said, hey, this is my girl. <laughs> this is what I need. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. So there must be lots of stories from those 25 years running Bugaboo Lodge. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, with Ooh. Jim Davies, the pilot. Jim Davies was the pilot for a long, long time. Yeah. First with this thing, and then with the Alloy 2, then the Alloy 3, then the 204, Bell 204, then the 205, and then the 212, which they still have today, which is a very reliable machine. The 205, was the same as the 212, but a single engine. And the pilots never liked it. Ed Pruss, he hated that machine. Well, one day we went over to the fourth quarters. There was one run over there was called uh, Seventh Heaven. I thought about went to heaven that day. And we went up there and the short shaft broke, whatever that is. <laughs> All of a sudden, we had no more power. The power there was no more engine. So he started coming down, I said, what the hell is he doing? I looked over, no power, oh no. So I tightened my seatbelt and <laughs> holy shit. And he, he came in like this. We were just about on top, but he didn't have enough power to pull away to do the auto rotation and land down below. But he didn't have enough power to get up either. So he rammed it around and whammo, and rammed it in. Hopefully we get stuck. Because if we come in like this and she start rolling, there would have been no survivors. Okay. But he, and he, he did get you stuck. But then we couldn't open the doors on the side because the thing was so crumbled, you know. The, the rotor cut the cab off in front of my face there. And as I said, the only casualty we had, I had to change my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it was pretty bad. And then the other guests, and, and Lynn was part of the group in the back. And they, when he stopped like this, they went forward like that, and then they couldn't go back because the engine was sitting there. The engine broke loose and came sort of into the cab, but not quite. Then they had to climb over my seat and the pilot's seat to get out of there. And they said, run, run, because I expected it any minute to blow up with this hot fuel, all those lines ripped apart. But it never did. I don't know why not. But then the pilot and I, we went back and we opened the hood in front and our radio equipment in those days wasn't worth a damn, it, it was terrible. But uh, we fiddled around with some wires and we got a message out and the Bugaboo Lodge picked it up and the Calgary Airport picked it up. Wow. We, we couldn't believe it, it was just a fluke. So, and then it conked out again, and nothing more. So Ed Bruss was madder than hell. He said, Ed, relax. They know now, it's up to them. But the second group was Frank Stark over <laughs> Rory Creek. And uh, the helicopter didn't come back. He thought, oh no. Radio, nothing. He said, they're all dead. He figured, ah, oh, that's the worst. But then after about two hours, all of a sudden, he saw two small machines flying over. He put two and two together. He said, they must have gotten a message out. They're OK. So then he relaxed, you know. Then they flew us out. Then they picked them up and flew them all home. And that was it. And then a couple of days later, I went with the chief mechanic from Calgary, Joel Sorens, and the pilot. We flew out there to pick up the junk, fly it out. And uh, when we flew out there, the, the 
Joe Sorens looked in there, there were pieces of the helicopter all over. Oh my God, he said. You must have been talking to the old man, huh? When that <laughs> happened. I sure did. But anyway, so we had a welding torch and cut everything apart and flew it out. So we got a new machine. And then after that, we got the 212. And so Ed was very happy and said, aha, we had to go through that to get that machine. <laughs> but we did. And we have this ever since. And that's a good machine. You know? Anyway. Wow, that's quite the story, Leo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you must have had lots of beautiful days of powder skiing, too. Oh, did we ever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, two years ago, in fact, Lynn and I were out there, and the guide was uh, a girl. She's uh, Lila. Uh, yeah, Mark's wife, and uh, we came down from Route 66 and said, Leo, you know that place, you lead. Hey, I'm a sort of freeloader here, you know. <laughs> so I was, Yahoo, let's go. And then we went down and then I got my red jacket, two million after retirement. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> which, of which I didn't pay for. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, you deserve them. You earned them. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. It was great. Wow, it's been a fabulous no, there's, life. As far as skiing goes, I can't think of another place in the world where it could be greater than that. Yeah. Sure, someday we have wind crust there too, or sun crust. But with the helicopter, you can always move to another area. And, you know, so we're not stuck like in a lift. You know, you want to hear my blackest day ever? Sure. <laughs> we started out once, one day, and I was group four. So the lead guide, of course, gets all the first choice of the bad snow, and group four gets what's left over. But I knew the area pretty well, so it's okay, I'll find a place. So we started out on South Side to go into Powder Pig. And there's sort of a, a canyon to go down but I came as group four, and I had a top-notch group, Pookie Dodge and his gang, they all could ski great, no problem. So I said, hey, listen, we just go down a little ways, then we go over on the left side, I cut off this avalanche, and then we can ski that slope, then we go into the woods, and it's beautiful skiing in there. Great, I had the right group. So we do that, I go over, jump, here goes the avalanche, and oh, shit! Hans Moses down there putting his ski back on. <laughs> he, he fell with the group before, and I shouted, Avalanche! And he looked up, capped this one ski, and took off on one ski. I thought, oh, not, not a good idea to bury the boss. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was, was mad at me, that you idiot. So anyway, we got that. Then we went up to a rooftop. And now on the way up, I already saw this was hammered by the wind, unbelievable. There were wind waves that high. I said, well, I'm not going to ski that, but I ski down on the north side, and that might be good. And it was. <coughs> but there again, uh, I wasn't that much at ease. I said, hey, listen, guys, stay here. I'm going to check this out. So I went in and jumped back and forth. She let me get right to the middle when she let go. And all of a sudden, the whole slope went down. So I struggled like hell over to the left side and got out of it and the thing went. And then the, the group was sort of stuck because Ann Jones, she was an Olympic skier, terrific skier, but she was scared of avalanche, unbelievable. She wasn't going to move. I said, come on, Ann, the avalanche is gone. And underneath often it's quite good ski, you know, once. It's like corn snow almost. So finally they came down and we kept on skiing. And then further on the north side, we had a we had lunch, okay? So we have lunch there. Um, and then we have to make our way back to the Bugaboo Lodge, you know, run after run after run, you know? Okay. So on the way up the rooftop, I knew over on the left side there, there's a nice slope down and there's a nice canyon down, which I know will be good snow. So I said, uh, we land on rooftop, but then we ski over there and down that slope into the canyon. But that slope again didn't look too kosher. So I said, uh, 
guy is so tall in here. So I went in and jumped around and she was hell, she let go. And all, it was about that deep, but all big chunks like icebergs, you know, and with crevasses between. If you fall between, it'll crush your leg, you know. So I had to jump from one to the other over to the woods. And when I got over to the, to the woods, the back of my ski was still on the moving snow, but the front of my skis was in the solid snow in the woods. So I got turned around and backwards, I was thrown into the woods. I said, oh, okay. So then I got out there and said, anybody else? <laughs> A little voice right there, Leo, Joe Jones, can you help me? I said, what the hell are you doing here? You're supposed to stay there. He said, I'm sorry. And uh, Dave, Dave Huff, he was on the other side. Anybody else? No? Okay, well, then come down. And Dave Huff over there said, Leo, I lost my ski. <laughs> oh, no. So we went over there, and everybody was bobbing. In an avalanche, you're looking for a, a ski. Well, forget it. <laughs> After about 10, 15 minutes, we gave up. He said, here, take my ski. I ski home on one ski. So I took my ski over and threw it over, and bang, it hit that ski. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> All stupid things. That one ski found the other ski. So now he had the second ski, okay, fine. Then we ski down that, that canyon there, and it was beautiful skiing. And now we go over to the last run down to the lodge. We ski down, we have three runs there, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We ski down the ugly, but only to a certain point. There's a forked tree, and we have to stop by, stop there, and then we go on this cat track over, and then you see the lodge down below, and we ski down to the lodge. Okay? Everybody here? Yeah? Except one. Oh no. Ruti Hoff. Dave Hoff is the one that lost his key. His wife is now missing. Oh no. Where the hell is she? Dave said, Leo, I know where she is. She's over on our ride. And uh, she will meet us as we come across. Yeah, she did, she made me. She hit me on the side, threw me into the ski, <laughs> cracked my shoulder, a bone, delaminated my head ski like an accordion. I said, oh no, what else do I need today? <laughs> Jesus Christ. So I said to the group, look guys, there's the lodge, go down, I stay at the end, make sure we don't lose anybody else. I was destroyed. That day. <laughs> then I came down to the lodge, and Hans just happened to be inside the door. He, he looked at me, and I think he knew I've had it today. He said, Leo, I think we need to go up to the bar and have a stiff drink. <laughs> I said, you're damn right, we do. <laughs> he bought me a big drink, and everything was okay. But then I had to ski the next few days with my arm in a sling, because the thing was cracked in here. But, so oh, it's well. not always powder snow and roses. Huh? It's not always powder, snow, and roses. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Wow. No, no. Sometimes it was pretty rough. But wow. you have to make the best of what you have. Yeah, you know? yeah, well, yeah. But in general, we usually had terrific snow. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ, yeah. I have never skied so many good hands anywhere else in my life, you know. Wow. Have you ever skied in the Bagabas? No, I, uh, well... Self-propelled, does that count? <laughs> the what? Self-propelled. Self-propelled. Yeah, no, I've never heli-skied in my life, actually. So what's your excuse? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Uh, Maybe uh, you and I should go in yeah, this we winter. We could, we could. Huh? We'll talk about it. Okay. We'll talk about it. Okay. But uh, do you want to do some questions from the floor? Some what? Qu questions from the floor? Do a, we, we've done an hour, over an hour, almost an hour and ten minutes. We could take some questions. Oh, questions, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah sure, we've, go ahead. We've, we've done a little more than an hour now. Lynn? So. The beacon story, the transceiver story. Lynn saying you should tell the story of the first time you used a beacon, a transceiver, a beacon. Yeah, we had uh, a guy, Lauten, 
from uh, the States. He was the inventor of the skatey, what they call the avalanche transceiver today. It was like a salami, about that long, and I, I bought in a war surplus store some of those pouches from the army. We could put him in there and strap him on. And the first year, we only bought enough for one group because we said, well, the first group is the most exposed, you know, and we didn't want to spend all that much money, so we bought just for one group. But then the other groups, they complained. They said, well, you know, we would like one too. Well, Jesus, then we had to buy one for everybody. And, uh, you know, but those things, they worked so well. I challenge anybody today, even with the fancier stuff, with this one. The only drawback was you had to put a, a thing in the ear with a wire on it, and uh, that you could hear everything. But as far as finding somebody, I find we that as good as anyone. Yeah, yeah. that, that yeah. was good. Yeah. yeah, is that what you meant, um, Lynn? Roy, Roy Fisher on Home Run. It was the, he was the first person found. He oh, saved his yeah, life with yeah, a, that's a right. Scotty. We had a, Hans Peter Stettler had a group and they went on, on Home Run, but they went over the edge and they're going to ski down there. But Hans Peter realized right away no, no, this is no good. He was going to come back. But those other guys, they shot past him and whammo, the avalanche went down. And uh, I was the uh, next group coming up. So Hans Peter said, Leo, we got missing some people. And two guys were over on the right side, pushed against the tree. One had some broken ribs. And uh, another one, I forgot what was wrong. But one was missing altogether. So they paid a lot of attention to those wounded animals there. And so I went down with my skatey back and forth, and I found him down there in the deposit, right down at the bottom, about that deep down. Roy Fisher, a geologist from Calgary. So I dug him up, and I got him out of there. He was unconscious, and he bit through his lip like this. You could pull up the lip and look right through. And, uh, anyway, so, but he was unconscious, so uh, Slapped him back and forth, and he woke up, and, <laughs> and then uh, as soon as he was out, he said, okay, let's go. <laughs> Boy, that guy was a cool character. He said, hey, just a second. No, I want to check you out first. First of all, that lip of yours. And we had a doctor, Otto Speaker, who was very, a little guy, but a very aggressive. He took care of those guys. He flew with one of them to Banff with a knife in his hand just in case his lungs collapse, because he said maybe one of those ribs will go into the lungs and he quit breathing. And so he was going to cut a hole too and let the air out. And, but he didn't have to do it. Well, I bet Roy but Fisher this, was this Roy, Roy Fisher <laughs> was the toughest character I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah. I mean, he, was, he could have been dead in another five minutes. He would have been dead. Yeah. But he come out, let's go skiing. Right. <laughs> Who cares? Right, right. Boy. Uh, one time for one more question, Bob. Leo, uh, I, I have a, or a question, but I also have a, a request. Um, you said years ago that people that are cold and wet are either poor or stupid. So when did you know that you weren't poor or stupid? Like when did you know you're there? Oh. Yeah. That's a hard question, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you want to come up and ask them, well, but okay. I'll, I'll make it oh, oh, oh. Leo, you're on well, camera. Can, can you I don't hear so well. Okay. Um, <laughs> you said years ago that people that are cold and wet are poor or stupid. So when did you realize that I'm not poor and I'm not stupid? And that was Frank Stark. He was my maintenance man. He was also a guide, a Tyrolean, who uh, always said uh, there's only two people that get cold. They're either poor well, they're stupid. <laughs> because if they have if money, haven't learned how to dress yet, they're stupid. <laughs> or they're so poor they can't buy the, the good stuff. That, that was Frank Stark. <laughs> okay. That was true. Okay, well, we're, we're getting. So I often, yeah. oh, I often use that 
when people said they were cold, I told them this story. Then they didn't complain about being cold. <laughs> <laughs> but they would have to be stupid. So, no, no, I'm not, I'm not good. Poor. Good, good. Sorry about that. No, that's fabulous. Maybe, should we end it there? Or one more question, end it there? Maybe, Leo, you could give us a little yodel, just to finish it off. Yodel! Leo. No, 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 no. no uh, <laughs> yeah. I would have many more stories, but we'd be sitting here by tomorrow night. <laughs> we could go on for a few more hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Oh well. Great. Well, thank anyway. you very much, Leo, on hey, behalf of the White Review. Thank you.